Uh, well, welcome, and it's great to have you all here. Uh, I'd like to um, remind you that uh, from my presentation uh, just last week uh, that I've tried uh, to identify for the laboratory uh, five uh, initiatives which I'd like us to really put our uh, all into focusing on in the next uh, period of time. It's not an exclusive list, and it's not to say that there won't be other activities, but these five, if we accomplished them, we would surely have uh, done a great deal. Uh, so we're going to start with the carbon cycle, next-gen light source, our community initiatives, making a safe and efficient lab, and dealing with issues of space. So that's a pretty big agenda. And any one of those is also really big. And, and today I'd like to talk with you about the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative <clears throat> and to give you a feeling for uh, how, it's, uh, how I'm seeing it evolving here at the laboratory. And then uh, it will be followed, of course, throughout this week by a series of uh, science talks which are intended to be tutorial and to offer to um, all of you who are interested some insight into what the state of the art is in the various fields and where we are coming up short where we could do much better. So um, you'll be seeing that. And of course, um, you know, we're sitting here in hallowed and historic ground. Uh, great uh, science has happened here over many, many decades. And uh, our lab is supposed to solve big problems. That's, that's what we're here for. And um, this is a big problem. So um, we've, we, you know, of course, that uh, if we look at the global carbon cycle, uh, it's um, uh, anthropogenic uh, activity, particularly from burning of fossil fuels, but a whole other host of uh, anthropogenic activities are altering uh, the, the global carbon cycle. It's, uh, none of our activities are quite as big as some of the reservoirs or even the flux of carbon through some of the natural phenomena that occur, but our activity added on to all of those components is enough to uh, incrementally be adding to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, not all of the CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere stays there, but enough of it does, and its effect uh, inside the atmosphere is to have a warming effect, so that in the end, um, we're faced finally with this question. And it's, we're gonna focus on it with respect to carbon cycle, but I will say that I believe uh, we're entering an era, and we are all familiar with it, um, where the scale of human activity is becoming similar to the uh, natural fluxes of matter and energy in the planet. We're not as big as them, but we're not negligible completely anymore either. So carbon cycle is the first example where we're going to come up with a type of problem in which the scale of human activity uh, is comparable to natural ones. And that means that we have to think more in terms of how we can establish uh, global cycles for our own activities. And we'll see more and more of that. And of course, uh, you're all very, very familiar uh, with these uh, images which have per pervaded the media and which you will have seen of uh, the shrinking uh, level of the um, uh, ice um, uh, that, that has been going on for some time now, for some decades, and which appears to be um, accelerating. So these are things that we really need to think about. And as I mentioned uh, to you um, a few days ago, we had this very interesting uh, I'll mention to you a, a blog post from Bill Gates recently uh, who said, well, if CO2 reduction is important, we really have to think about getting to zero. And what he means by uh, getting to zero, of course, is with respect to transportation and uh, our use of uh, electricity and other such things, which you know, we have to generate from someplace, that he'd like to see those things get to zero. I think we all would. That's, that's essentially what we're talking about. And, and, and as he says here, uh, sometimes we miss the, just to make the message really clear, and maybe people have failed in many cases to begin to grasp the scope and scale of innovation that is needed. And that's what I would like to uh, continue to emphasize to you today, is that the scope and scale of innovation that's needed for us to achieve our goals is really quite breathtaking. Uh, in fact, uh, the actual post in, uh, in, in Bill Gates' blog was called uh, Innovation, Not Insulation. And, and I'm really gratified that uh, actually a few days later he changed it to Innovation, Not Just Insulation. <laughs> uh, because that was an uh, intemperate uh, blog post there. And, uh, but, but, but what he did say was that, um, 
you know, should society spend a lot of time trying to insulate houses and telling people to turn off lights, or should it spend time on accelerating innovation? Well, uh, okay, so to my mind, uh, this tells us right away why it's so urgent for our laboratory to have an initiative called Carbon Cycle 2.0, where we can both uh, lay out for the nation and the world what the best technical understanding our community can come to about these issues is uh, in a comprehensive way. And that's going to be one of our main goals in this activity. Uh, because here is a person who's clearly very uh, capable and thought about it, but I don't think he has quite the right answer there. And, and, and so that's very interesting. And uh, here we can also see Steve's list, uh, which we talked about a little bit last week as well. And uh, these are the types of innovations that are being called upon. For example, uh, batteries with three times today's energy density that can take 15 years of deep discharges, or uh, utility scale energy storage systems that would enable renewable energy. These are enormous, enormous scale uh, innovations that are being called for, but are we really fully equipped to deliver them? And uh, I think this is something to really think through very, very carefully because um, the fact is that um, if we look at the whole problem and the scale of what's being asked for, uh, I'm not convinced that our laboratory has yet uh, stepped up to the level that it's capable of to contribute to this problem and to make the kinds of uh, um, uh, developments possible through our research that we can do. And so we may fall short. And uh, the risks of falling short are multiple and not ones that we would really like to see happen. So uh, it's also true that uh, one of the things about this laboratory is that it is a basic science laboratory from its history and from its DNA. And uh, the fact is that the kinds of problems that we're being asked to uh, innovate on with respect to, for example, batteries, solar, uh, and other technologies require really uh, a much higher degree of control of energy and matter on the nanoscale at very low cost and very high volume, um, not to mention the development of new tools like the next generation light source. So all of these things uh, have led me ultimately to think uh, along with colleagues here about how do we integrate our various energy and environment research activities here at the laboratory and how we could bring them together into a larger scale initiative. So let me make some um, uh, general statements first of all about our various energy and environment initiatives and how they've developed over the past several years. Uh, for example, we've had an effort in energy efficiency for decades now and it's uh, an incredibly, incredibly important activity. It's probably the one single most important thing that we could do over the next 10 to 15 years that would actually make a really big difference in this space. So we're very fortunate to have had that research activity, and it's an activity that needs to accelerate uh, even further. Uh, we've had a really, really great program in energy storage. I see John Newman here. Uh, who's helped to lead that effort over the past uh, couple of decades, and it's been growing a lot in the last uh, few years. It's maybe uh, triple the size that it was five years ago. Uh, we've had great research in combustion research, and uh, we've been uh, quite fortunate also to have uh, some of the wonderful work done uh, in the EET, uh, EETD division with Ashok and uh, others, uh, the China Energy Group and so on in the developing world. Uh, so we've had an important initiatives in that area. And um, when the Helios project uh, first was conceived, it was conceived of as an effort to try to develop our ability to harness the sun in the most effective way uh, to make fuel, uh, but also to improve our research in the area of photovoltaics and to ultimately build the longer term effort in artificial photosynthesis. So uh, starting about two and a half years ago or so, we ended up having much larger programs in solar PV and of course in biofuels and a program in artificial photosynthesis that didn't exist a few years before that here at this laboratory. So things are growing in that respect. And um, we've had uh, a tremendous addition of uh, people to add on to uh, with Bill, who will be speaking after me, in the climate modeling space to add on to some of the existing exist, uh, activities which have been here in climate modeling. Of course, for the long term, we've had wonderful work in energy analysis. And just in the last year and a half, 
we've got new activities in carbon capture and sequestration to energy frontier research centers, very basic science underlying those areas of activity. So suddenly you see that uh, if you look at our energy and environment initiatives, you start to see that there's all these pieces to them. And uh, as I uh, was contemplating them all, starting about a year ago, uh, I came to appreciate more and more how much it was necessary for all of these pieces ultimately to become connected with each other and to recognize that, for example, uh, if we look at them as a complete initiative, what I would call the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative, then we can see the importance of efficiency. Of course, that helps us to avoid having to use carbon, but at the same time, we can see that, for instance, uh, going down this side of the, of the plot here and just looking at it, um, the first thing is, of course, if we do burn fuel, to burn it as efficiently as possible. And as you'll see momentarily, uh, the best thinking that we have here at the laboratory suggests to us that uh, no matter how hard we try in the short term, there's going to be uh, such a continued use of fossil fuel that we're going to have to figure out how to use the, uh, how to store the CO2 uh, in the interim while we're trying to develop new technologies. And meanwhile, of course, uh, if, we can, if we can be successful with biofuels and with artificial photosynthesis, those offer us a way to take CO2 and water with the energy of the sun and make a fuel so that ultimately we could create a, 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 a human cycle for carbon that is uh, sustainable. So those are all on this side of the curve. It's using uh, carbon uh, uh, in a combustion way or in some other way, but allowing us ultimately to do that in a more effective manner. And on this side, it's essentially trying essentially not to use the carbon. So we've got, of course, the efficiency, uh, the solar PV. We've got issues in the developing world and with energy storage. And increasingly, it became clear that all of these pieces have to fit together into a single puzzle and to have a common analysis. And that's the case I'm going to be trying to make to you uh, today. So let me start with trying to give you a description of what are the goals of this initiative. Um, Actually, the principal goal of this initiative is really to make sure that the laboratory itself has the biggest impact in this space that it's capable of doing. And to my mind, that means a much, much stronger and deeper and pervasive link between the basic and applied research uh, in the areas that relate to this. Uh, what we need is a vehicle for education and action on this research within the laboratory. And I'd like to amplify on that to give a feeling for what I mean. At the level of the science, we have lots of people here in the laboratory who are making wonderful discoveries in fundamental science who can contribute more to the issues of carbon cycle research than they are today. And one thing that prevents them from being able to do that is enough understanding about how the work that they're doing can plug in or help in the problems which our experts in the applied side have a deep understanding of. But our experts on the applied side may not always be aware of the incredible developments that are going on in the basic research laboratories, just one building next to them or two buildings next to them, and they're just not aware of it. So what we have is a situation where we need to increase our level of communication around these problems to a much, much higher degree. And it's a process of mutual education in which people on the basic side need to find out more about what the best understanding is about the applied problems. And the people on the applied side need to learn much more about what are the fundamental discoveries that are going on. And in that situation, we can create a problem-rich environment in which our most creative uh, scientists from all flavors can have the most impact on the problems that we're dealing with. So in many ways, the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative is aimed internally at all of our scientists to serve as a vehicle for education and action so that people will be uh, starting, somebody new coming in to work on the problem who has worked, for example, in some very fundamental area of uh, chemistry or material science or physics, uh, that that person can start at a high level right away by getting all the information from colleagues here. And likewise, if you're facing a critical problem uh, in your uh, own field of applied science, uh, you can go and quickly get to the most uh, basic fundamental research that will help you uh, in that area. So that's one of the main goals here, is to ensure the maximum impact. That's, that's, the, that's really the principal goal. But it also will, I think, if we develop it as a community in the correct way, 
provide a tremendous focal point for our interactions with our local community. Our local community, of course, is deeply dedicated to seeing a resolution to this problem. And it can only emerge with a whole lot of new science and technology, like what this lab is capable of doing. So uh, the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative, I believe, will provide a tremendous bridge, a tremendous networking opportunity for us to be uh, uh, interacting with our local community, but also, of course, with the national and global communities. And part of that is by providing, through a more systematic analysis of the problems that we're dealing with here, the kind of information that would help, for example, to avoid having a statement like uh, innovation, not insulation. Okay? Uh, that can only happen if we're out there providing uh, the best technical guidance about what the future of energy is going to look like uh, from the perspective of this laboratory. Now, I have gotten a lot of questions from people at various times. Some are very, very indirect in how they say these things uh, because they don't want to be offensive to me in some way, okay? So I hear these things, but you know, you've got to really have your ear attuned to understand, oh yeah, that's a criticism coming at me. Because uh, this is a very shy bunch here at the lab. And sometimes you can't t quite tell what they're thinking. So, uh, so, for example, is this more about science or PR? Well, I hope what I just told you convinces you, to my opinion, this is really fundamentally science-driven, but it has tremendous benefits uh, also in terms of our relationships with the community around us and with everybody else. But fundamentally, it is about making sure that our science is taking place at the highest level possible. And it means hundreds and thousands of individual conversations and uh, group uh, meetings and tutorials which will raise the level of science in this area to a much higher degree than we have done hitherto. Uh, then the question, which I think is a very reasonable one, is can Berkeley Lab really do it all? Don't we need a specific focus? And the answer is uh, we cannot do it all. <laughs> we will be part of a national and global research community. Uh, and we will partner with many, many others. We will partner with other national labs, with universities, with industry, with colleagues in other places. So by no means do we have a vision that we're going to try and do every aspect of the climate problem and solve it all here. Uh, that's not the intent to say here. But on the other hand, there is the question of do we need a specific focus? And another question which I got from several people who got very nervous when they saw this initiative popping up and that it's, is, does this mean we're somehow moving away from basic research? And, and, and so uh, let me say something about the Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative and then I'll come back to that last uh, uh, question. And that is um, the very, very, very deep uh, importance of basic science that's embedded inside this problem. And what I mean by that uh, is that if we develop, for example, here at the laboratory, a new theoretical tool, a new framework for thinking about a certain class of problem, a new, a new algorithm for using the computer more effectively, uh, a novel material, a new spectroscopic tool, a new uh, negative index of refraction lens that allows you to focus light more tightly, or a membrane, a catalyst, a new microscopy, any of those things, those are powerful tools which can reach out and touch all the way across the board to every aspect of this problem. And uh, they can touch biofuels, they can touch uh, even efficiency and combustion, all the different parts. And so coming back for a moment to these questions of um, don't we need a specific focus uh, my answer to it is what we see is an interconnected problem which can benefit from the fundamental discoveries that this lab is capable of. So I'm sure that it will turn out over a period of time that some of those circles on there uh, will be bigger than others in terms of their budget, okay? But in the end, what people need to be thinking about is the whole problem. And they need to be thinking about how uh, research that this laboratory can do can impact all the different parts. And that's why I don't want to you know, say, OK, uh, Berkeley Lab, OK, there's the, there's the carbon problem, but we're going to focus on uh, biofuels and uh, uh, sequestration. And the other parts, other laboratories are going to do. Uh, I don't believe that would be the right answer for us, because uh, intrinsically, our fundamental science can touch all the different parts of the problem. And the most important thing for us to do is to make sure that we have all of these pieces, uh, uh, we have enough uh, expertise in all of these pieces that the basic piece is uh, interconnecting it uh, successfully. 
I'm going back one more uh, last time. So I think it's obvious Berkeley Lab is not moving away from basic research. In fact, to the contrary, uh, in every sense, uh, basic research should be uh, tightly integrated with this activity and should sort, it, this activity should serve as a source of inspiration. Uh, and I will go back, uh, and I hope that uh, you won't be uh, unhappy with me for doing it, uh, to my own experiences at Bell Laboratories, because I was a young scientist there, and we heard a lot about Bell Laboratories previously. And <laughs> in fact, uh, it was a very problem-rich environment. When you walked into that place, there was so much expertise around uh, the class of problems that it was working on, that immediately you could bring yourself up to a very high level of research. And that's what we're aiming for here in this initiative. Immediately, once you're in this environment, you've got so much information coming at you from every side that if there's an aspect of it you want to know about, very quickly your research can be uh, at the top of the levels. Uh, Will we be able to get funds to directly support CC2O? Uh, many people have been skeptical, saying, well, that doesn't sound like a funding initiative. And, you know, that's true. Uh, it doesn't, actually. Uh, I doubt that we'll have a research grant ever called CC2.0, uh, but I'm not so worried about that. I'm convinced that if we raise our level and we raise our game, then all the little pieces will be doing better and better and better, and the laboratory itself will come out way, way ahead. So I'm not so worried about it, but um, there it is. So now um, let me go into the specifics. I'm just going to quickly go through the various parts of the initiative. Uh, climate modeling and energy analysis is where it all uh, starts because that's the only way we're going to end up knowing if where we're heading is in the right direction or not. And uh, Bill will be speaking afterwards about this. And I think uh, you all know that if you look at diagrams like these, which show the energy incoming from the sun, as well as all the ways in which energy leaves the planet, that these are uh, extraordinarily complex uh, phenomena uh, in which we have uh, uh, you know, clouds, aerosols, uh, atmospheric gases that can trap heat, uh, reflectivity from the different surfaces, the oceans. It's an incredibly complex problem with so many different uh, pieces to it. Uh, that our whole, our whole global science community is engaged in trying to make these models better and better and to make them um, uh, more accurate and to build them in such a way that they will be as robust as possible. And Bill's going to talk about that. There are so many aspects to this. I don't think I'm going to go into too much of it other than to say um, I, I'm very, very uh, excited about the prospect that our lab will be doing more and more very important work in this area. Uh, just, well, just quickly as an example, we do know, for instance, uh, from many, many different fields uh, that it's extremely important uh, in your computer algorithms uh, to spend all your computation time where the most action is taking place. But in, for example, the prior models for climate modeling, the globe was divided into equal segments and energy fluxes in and out of those were all computed. Uh, up here we show an example of an, an, an adaptive grid in which when all the, if all the action is taking place at a coastline, for example, or at the edge of an ice sheet and not in the middle, then you'd like to focus your computational resources there. There's great challenges for applied mathematics and for computer modeling to succeed in applying those kinds of adaptive grid algorithms to the climate modeling uh, in, in the future, and people are working on that very hard here. You'll also see uh, great new work, I hope, from Bill in trying to uh, increase our ability to predict abrupt climate change, which may be something that we're dealing with right now, uh, and uh, we need to have a finer understanding of how to go about that. So, so since Bill will be talking afterwards, I won't say too much more about that. Uh, I hope that many of you are aware of the history of the Cool Roofs project here at the laboratory. It's something that we can all be very proud of, that it came from this laboratory. There's been a lot of study of what would be the impacts of uh, switching uh, black colored roofs to light colored ones in parts of the uh, United States and the world where the sun is very bright and it's very hot. And uh, we know that that can have a uh, very substantial impact uh, on that. Uh, let's imagine now as we think about the carbon cycle project and the, the, the deepness of the interconnections of the different parts of the problem, uh, here are some examples of uh, the integrated way of thinking that I'd like to encourage this laboratory to be engaged in as much as possible. Imagine that we were successful and suddenly we had 50 or 60 million acres of solar panels out in the desert. Uh, we've now replaced uh, tan colored uh, desert with black colored solar cells on the scale of millions and millions of acres. 
Uh, what are the heat island effects associated with those? And what would be the effects on climate? Maybe they won't affect the climate globally, but they sure could have effects regionally on climate that could be quite significant. And we need to think those things through because it's one thing for us to be able to say, well, it's right for the planet to do this, and it's another thing to have appreciated what the regional climate effects might be of implementing a solution which could have adverse or not adverse effects uh, on regions that are nearby. Similarly, you'll be aware of the fact that uh, natural gas has been found to be in much greater abundance than we realized even just a few years ago, mainly because of drilling techniques which allow uh, the ability to drill uh, with pressurized fluids in such a way that we can get access to natural gas from types of rocks that weren't accessible previously. Well, what would happen if we switched from coal to natural gas? That may be politically something difficult to do, but it's something we can think through. Uh, and of course, in many ways, it's going to be net positive uh, for the environment because uh, it's a uh, fuel which uh, per usable unit of energy puts out less CO2, but in fact, it also makes many fewer aerosols. And those aerosols, of course, can condense clouds, and those clouds can have a cooling effect. And so it's a much more complicated problem than to just say, we switched and everything is good. Uh, they're actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more integrated than that. So these are some just very crude first examples of integrated ways of thinking that can emerge as we build up the initiative to be one in which we think in a more integrated way. Uh, now, the next uh, piece I'd like to mention to you is the efficiency piece. And uh, I'd like you to all remember this graph. It's a very famous one. Um, it shows the, um, um, uh, uh, it shows here the efficiency of refrigerators in the blue curve as a function of the time, and it shows that in the, in the 1970s when regulation was imposed on the refrigerators, that suddenly the efficiency of the refrigerators became uh, greater and greater. And the important lesson from this to remember is that the, um, uh, at the same time, the price of the refrigerators continued to go down, as shown in the green curve on there. So the efficiency of the refrigerators became greater, but the cost to the consumer continued to be less and less. And that's one of the big lessons about efficiency, is nobody gains from having an inefficient system, but the system doesn't necessarily change unless you provide the incentive for it to happen. And that's what our colleagues in the ETD taught the whole world, really, uh, about the efficiency topic. Uh, in the red, you see the size of the refrigerator. And what you can see is that the refrigerators got bigger and bigger uh, until they asymptotically stopped changing because they could not fit through the doors anymore. <laughs> and you'll notice the uptick at the very end, which is because they made the doors bigger. And so, you know, but the, the, the key uh, impact of efficiency was enormous. And that's seen, of course, especially through the impact uh, in the state of California, where you can see that the energy use per person uh, from uh, the electricity use per person uh, went up in the United States uh, throughout uh, the 1980s and 90s, while in California it was absolutely flat. And uh, the GDP in California uh, was quite fine during that period uh, compared to the rest of the United States, uh, indistinguishable really. So uh, the fact is that the, that, 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 that the, um, uh, the nation as a whole was more profligate in its energy use, but with no benefit to show from it. Uh, and we could make ourselves far more efficient with more regulation. The biggest opportunity today in this area, by far, is in buildings. And uh, our division here has devoted itself to studying the issue of efficiency in buildings. Uh, they use uh, almost three quarters of the nation's electricity. And um, they're responsible for almost 40% of all CO2 emissions. So uh, commercial buildings in particular are an important focus for us. And today, our uh, EETD division, along with colleagues in the College of Engineering on the campus and uh, uh, colleagues elsewhere, are in the midst of imagining a new buildings initiative. Inside the building, we have uh, three main things that we can tweak on. Uh, the facade, whether light is coming in or out or energy is coming in and out of the building, uh, is controlled to some degree through the facade. Uh, the HVAC, you know, what, what kind of heating and cooling we're doing, and of course the lighting. And normally those three, three things are essentially treated independently from each other. And as time is going on, uh, folks here are beginning to understand the importance of a new way of thinking about the building in which we have, first of all, 
pervasive monitoring. That is, we would be collecting lots more data than we do presently. All over the place, we could have sensors. And at the same time, we could have uh, what's called an integrated operating system, an operating system for the building that gives it instructions on how to modulate these different parts. And likewise, some model-driven control. So if we could develop those three things, the pervasive modeling, the operating system, and the model-driven control, we could ultimately uh, think through more how to make sure that we keep occupant productivity, how to couple into the sustainable grid, because the grid in the future is going to be having its own fluctuations as we have a bigger piece of renewable built into it. And the buildings can be used as a piece that can modulate up and down to enable the sustainable grid to work better. Uh, so that's another piece that we need to think, of course, and of course the environment around us. All those things together will create a building of the future, which is a responsive building that uh, is much more controlled than anything that we have today. And it's a, it's a grand vision, and, and, and I really hope that it comes uh, about and that we have more research in that area to build it. Uh, combustion. Uh, the fact is that combustion provides 83% uh, of our energy. <laughs> So uh, that's where the energy is, and we have to come to terms with that fact. Of course, we'd love to see renewables uh, uh, be a much bigger part of our energy equation than it is today, but it isn't. And it takes a very, very long time to change a system as big as the energy system that we have today. And so combustion is going to be with us for quite a long time. And it turns out that here at the laboratory, I see Robert Cheng here from ETD invent, invented these very interesting low swirl burners. We have wonderful work done by our colleagues. We have the leading research group uh, in the world in combustion at the Sandia Combustion Research Facility. And they do some of their work here, and we need to collaborate more and more with them in order to build our combustion research activities to be greater. And we have uh, tremendous modeling activities going on in uh, our computation division. Uh, 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 related to combustion. So we have uh, some very important elements for what looks like an exciting new combustion research initiative emerging here at the laboratory, coupled as well to the uh, very high power analytical tools which are available at the chemical dynamics beamline at the advanced light source. So combustion looks like an exciting area where we'll be seeing lots of new developments. It's going down that cycle now, going we're just going down this cycle, combustion, and now we're going to go to carbon capture and sequestration and a few general comments about that. The fact is that we emit so much CO2 into the atmosphere, 30 gigatons roughly globally a year, and uh, it's really not going to be easy for us to figure out how to completely get off of that on a time scale that's appropriate for dealing with the issues of climate change. And therefore, we really need to think more seriously about how we're going to enable capture and sequestration. That would be removing CO2 from the flue gas that's emitted at a power plant and taking that CO2 and putting it someplace that's not the atmosphere. And we're going to have to do it. Here you can see one of many, many models. There are so many of these models um, which are up there that try to predict what is the future going to look like. But the fact is that every model that shows emissions of CO2 which eventually start to come down again uh, they all have a big wedge, often the biggest wedge, associated with CCS. And I haven't seen anybody who can make a proposal that would say we really can readily get there without doing a significant piece of this. And so I personally believe that it's going to be an essential piece of the puzzle. Now, it turns out that um, our scientists here and colleagues elsewhere have done their best to estimate the current costs. And it turns out uh, that if we were to capture CO2 from flue gas, the power plant is emitting CO2, and if we take the CO2 out and capture it, that the cost of doing that works out to be about $70 a ton, or seven cents per kilowatt hour. That you can think of different ways. I mean, many of you here probably pay about 12 cents a kilowatt hour for your energy at home, um, if you're in the lower tiers of the energy use. And so you have to think for yourselves whether it's acceptable to imagine that going up by 50% more or not. But for many people, they consider that unacceptable. For others, maybe it would be. I can't really answer that. But so here's another way of looking at it. Instead of just looking at the cost, let's calculate the energy that the power plant has to use in order to capture the CO2 as a fraction of its total energy output. The plant's putting out energy. We're capturing the CO2 now. Some of the energy that the power plant is putting out 
has to go into capturing the CO2. What fraction is that? It works out to be between 25 and 30 percent. So it means that that power plant is working very, very hard to capture that CO2. It's such a large fraction that you start to feel, well, that doesn't seem quite vi viable. Uh, there's a wonderful research activity that's emerged uh, to look at new materials which can capture the carbon. Uh, these are things like metal organic uh, frameworks, uh, very new types of polymer or peptoid kind of membranes which could capture the CO2 and could tune the binding energy of the CO2 to the molecular sites uh, inside the high surface area material. There's a very good chance that a new material will emerge from this research uh, within the next several years and that that material could revolutionize carbon capture. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and I think it's wonderful. Our earth science division here has been doing work for a very long time now in uh, sequestration. For example, at the uh, Insula project in Algeria and also some projects uh, in California and elsewhere where CO2 is being taken and being stuck underground uh, already. Uh, in fact, uh, the one thing, and it says up there that it's about $8 million per year, and one of the things that I learned to my great surprise not too long ago was that the biggest budget item uh, for these types of projects is actually buying the CO2 to stick underground, which <laughs> doesn't seem right, but <laughs> uh, that's it, you know. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to think about in that, but we won't go there now. Uh, we have a new Energy Frontier Research Center so that this activity now can go beyond the uh, actual uh, sequestration to the study of the science that underlies it and to understand, for example, what is the phase diagram of supercritical CO2 inside briny water when it's inside the tiny little regions inside the um, uh, pores uh, underground? Uh, and uh, how does CO2 diffuse? How does it react with the surfaces of uh, the minerals? Can we enhance the rate of mineralization? Can we alter it? Can we understand it better? And especially, can we know more about how CO2 spreads out uh, from when it's pumped underground to a particular place, does it spread or not? Um, one way of summarizing this uh, particular area, uh, sorry, let me just go back for a moment. Uh, one way of summarizing this particular area is to say that all the cost is in the capture, but the risk is in the sequestration part. And many people are worried about it. If we stick the CO2 underground, will it stay there? Will we know where it went? Can we verify that it's still there? And so on. So the very fundamental research that's going on here in the Earth Science Division with many, many colleagues from other parts of the laboratory. I know people from the Molecular Foundry and from other parts of the lab are engaged in this now. Very, very fundamental research to try to understand, can we provide the basis for a future risk assessment in this area? The one thing to remember, people will often ask, uh, wouldn't it be okay to take the CO2 and make some products with it because there's so much of it? And the answer is definitely that's a fine thing to do. Just remember that the top 100 bulk chemicals in the world, the top 100 chemicals produced in the world add up to half a gigaton and our CO2 emissions globally are about 30. So it's a factor of 60 between the top 100 chemicals and the CO2 that's being emitted. And this is what brings it home to us about the scale of the problem, okay? It's one thing to think about, uh, I could do something in the lab that might make a difference uh, and I can demonstrate it, but what you have to understand that this problem is different from almost any other this laboratory has worked on um, in terms of fundamental research previously because it's not enough to come up with an answer that works in principle on a laboratory scale. It has to be something that can scale to enormous, enormous areas and sizes, and in this case, um, I doubt that there's something we can do commercially with the CO2 that's big enough to really matter on this uh, scale. The main thing we could do would be to learn how to take CO2 in water and sunlight and make fuel because then it would be consistent with the scale that we're talking about and, and that's what we, you know, we could really learn how to do. And of course, that's what biofuels would do. Uh, so biofuels are very exciting in that respect. Uh, here's an important graph for you to uh, look at and become familiar with. Um, this just shows the power consumption of the United States, which is around 3.3 terawatts. And let's imagine taking a certain piece of land, 
For example, you could imagine taking one quarter of the land that's used for agriculture, that would be about 60 million acres in the United States. One quarter of the agricultural land would amount to about 60 million acres. Imagine taking that land and devoting it to energy. And so now we have the flux of uh, uh, photons that are coming from the sun hitting that 60 million acres, and we're converting that energy per unit time into a usable form. Okay, so imagine that we did that at 1% efficiency, 3% efficiency, or 10% efficiency. What you can see here is that at 1% power efficiency, we can um, replace all of our gasoline. And at maybe 7 or 8%, we could replace all of our energy use. So 60 million acres, it's a lot of acres, uh, but it's about enough, okay, for us to pull the whole thing off. The trick is we have to be somewhere between 1% and 7% power efficiency for it to really count on a big scale. Uh, the most efficient biological plant uh, that we know of grows at about 0.3% power efficiency. And that's why you hear questions about if we uh, establish the biofuels on a big scale, how will it compete against uh, food? The fact is we could get uh, 10, 15, 20% of our uh, uh, gasoline consumption quite readily from biofuels, and it would make a positive contribution towards the problem. But if we want to look towards a, a way of getting most of our energy from it, we have to increase the power efficiency beyond what photosynthesis can do. So uh, biofuels has many key challenges, and probably the biggest one is to increase the power efficiency to deal with this issue of the scaling of the land use. Uh, here we have uh, wonderful research activities going on at the laboratory with the Joint Bioenergy Institute, uh, which involves many uh, institutions from the Bay Area working together. And it's a model, really, for how research can go all the way from fundamental science uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the applied, tackling every aspect of this problem. Really, in every sense, the JBay is a model for us and for the nation and the world for how to do research in this area. And uh, we can be quite excited that um, uh, this week, uh, or last week, I guess, in Nature, we had a wonderful uh, new report of a way to modify microbes so that they will make, actually, um, uh, diesel fuel, basically, uh, inside the microbes. Uh, so it's a fantastic piece of uh, microbial engineering, if you will, and it looks like a great and very exciting discovery. And uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that the biofuels research here at the laboratory is going to make a big difference in terms of getting us uh, to where biofuels can become a good piece of what our uh, current energy use is, although not such a big fraction that it completely uh, deals with the whole problem. And so that brings us really to artificial photosynthesis. And again, this statement that ultimately we need to get the power efficiency to be a bit higher. We have a wonderful initiative here at the laboratory. It's been going for about 18 months now that involves trying to make artificial photosynthesis instead of natural photosynthesis. And it involves a group of scientists from the chemical sciences division and material sciences and physical biosciences all working together trying to learn more about um, how we could build some artificial photosynthetic apparatus that would take CO2 and water and the energy from the sun and combine them to make fuel. And we've got three prototypes uh, in this project. I say we because it's one that I'm involved in personally. We've got some prototypes up on the table, and everybody's busily trying to build these prototypes, and they're not quite all built yet, but there are half and three-quarter parts of them all over the place, and segments of it are working and not all of it, and, and that's kind of where it stands but it's an exciting project. And if it worked, of course, uh, then we would move down this part of the curve and we would come to here and we would say, okay, we've actually got a cycle. But meanwhile, we don't quite yet have that, and so we've got a lot of work to do. Energy in the developing world. Um, on this graph, what you see is the um, income per person here and the CO2 emissions. And the size of each circle is the population of the country. I'll, I'll play it again so you can, you can see it, okay, all going by. And this is over some decades, right? And, and so what you can see here is, for example, the United States, and you can see uh, that as our, uh, our population is growing, but our income is growing, and our CO2 consumption is growing a lot, and uh, that's what's happening with us. And then you'll notice, oh, like little points like this one right here, okay? There's a country that actually has more income per person than us, but uses a really 
very tiny fraction of the amount of CO2 per person emitted into the atmosphere compared to us. So it's clearly possible to follow two different ways on this trajectory. One, where you hug kind of close to the baseline here, so you don't emit that much CO2, but the wealth goes up. And the other one, where you just are kind of profligate, and the CO2 goes through the roof. And now we've got all these countries here, which haven't yet hit this part of the curve. And the question is, are they going to go this way, or are they going to go that way? <laughs> and we don't know the answer to that. But if they go this way, we're in a lot of trouble. And if they go this way, it's viable. We can make the whole thing work. And so it's incumbent on us to help that happen. And it won't happen naturally. Because in, in the developing world, what, what, what countries will do is they'll adopt the technology at hand that is the one that they can grab a hold of the quickest. And they won't necessarily look at this issue of global CO2 emission unless we provide uh, a kind of science base and a technology base that makes it viable to develop in a reasonable amount of time without having uh, to give up essentially the development of the income as a trade-off against the CO2. And clearly with the size of China and India, but also all these other circles, uh, if we don't get this right, then things are really not going to be good. Now, the lab has a great history of working in the developing world. Here's two of the projects that um, have come from EETD with Ashok. Uh, Gadgel, uh, the Darfur stove, which burns biofuel twigs and things that refugee, uh, refugees in the camps in Darfur uh, can burn their fuels uh, three times more efficiently uh, than they could previously. The UV waterworks, which provides a way to get clean water without expending so much energy, but also to keep the health of people high. So we have some existence proofs where our lab has made some great discoveries. Uh, today, some of our folks are involved in uh, the Lumina project, which would allow people to have lighting uh, that isn't kerosene-based, so that when they're inside a room and trying to read at night, they're not poisoning themselves. And also that the energy consumption, again, and the um, atmosphere would be spared. And uh, uh, we need to acknowledge the wonderful, wonderful efforts that have happened uh, through the China Energy Group that Mark, uh, Mark Levine started 20 years ago, and that's had a huge impact. Uh, during the period when uh, GDP in China uh, quadrupled, uh, energy consumption only went up by two. So their efficiency went up by a factor of two during that period. And a lot of that can be attributed to efforts to improve energy efficiency during that period of time. A huge impact. Uh, we're starting a new project now uh, with College of Engineering and the lab together uh, called Bidgley, which will look at um, uh, energy consumption in India uh, and, and we're very hopeful that that will develop as well. Uh, solar uh, PV instead of photosynthesis, but making electricity. Uh, just to remind you, the sun itself puts out about 6,000 times more energy than we actually need. Uh, so it's a great place for us to go and get the energy that we need to get. Uh, there's a huge uh, surplus of energy coming at us from the sun uh, every single day. And there's new activities at the lab which have started in recent years. And the big issue in solar, of course, is to try to find a way to bring down the cost of installed solar. Uh, there have been huge strides in the industry in recent years, but it still falls far short of where it needs to to achieve the kind of widespread adoption that we need. And uh, one thing which I would like to point out here, which is crucial for us, is what we call the terawatt challenge. And this is a big piece of what Carbon Cycle 2.0 needs to do. It's one thing for our scientists here to invent a new kind of photovoltaic, which I might, might have a great efficiency or be very low cost. But you also have to invent one which is capable of generating a terawatt or more of power. And what's shown here on this bar graph is a calculation that uh, Cyrus Wadia did a while ago, just saying, let's take, for example, CAD Telluride. That's a famous thin film. The, the top company in the world in thin film solar, First Solar, is using CAD Telluride as their technology. Well, and that's a great technology. It's developing well. It's un, probably under a dollar a watt now, uh, pre-installation for the modules. Uh, so that's a great thing. But the fact is, if you took um, all the tellurium uh, in the world that you could access and made solar cell out of it, and you added it up, it doesn't come anywhere close to a terawatt. So we would run out before we could make enough solar cell. Uh, so that's, you know, it's great, but it's not quite going to get us there. 
Um, this is the type of analysis that we need to have coming from our energy analysis group in consultation with the scientists who are in, for example, materials or chemistry, so that we can have a deeper thinking about what are the materials that are going to scale. The same thing is going to apply, for example, when we go to energy storage and batteries. In fact, let me do that right now, uh, coming to energy storage. Uh, the fact is, uh, if you want to know about batteries, uh, this is the uh, volumetric or gravimetric, in other words, by volume or by weight, energy density of different fuels. And you can see we tend to like things like gasoline and diesel because you, they only have a rel relatively small gas tank in your car. You can go really far. Uh, and this shows the volumetric and gravimetric energy density of a battery. So if you want to go as far with the battery as you can with the gasoline, you've got to devote much more of the car to the energy storage piece, and pretty soon you're not riding in it anymore because you don't fit. So, so there's big problems there. And, and we need to get batteries that have a higher uh, energy density than we do now. Um, this is something which uh, Andy Grove has made the point about, which I think is incredibly important just with respect to this. If we look at the three big areas in which we consume energy, residential, industrial, and then transportation, it turns out that we can have almost any source of energy, whether it's renewables or coal or gas or oil, that can contribute to residential or industrial. But our transportation tends really only to be able to take dominantly oil and to some degree uh, biofuels, okay? Uh, but if suddenly electric vehicle becomes enabled, then any source, any input source of our energy can head to transportation. And that's why it's such an important piece because it allows a transformation in the energy industry. The other thing which Andy Grove shared was his feeling that the battery will play the role for vehicles in the future much like the computer processor has in the computer industry. In other words, whoever has the very best technology in batteries can control that industry as a company or a nation. So that's something to think about. And the fact is that our energy density is kind of poor. It's a little bit hard to see these things on here. But again, this just makes the point that the energy density of the um, uh, batteries is quite poor compared to gasoline. And also uh, that the cost is very high if we try to implement batteries. So not only is the volume not helping us, but the cost of them is quite high uh, as well. Now, uh, we have here tremendous innovation going on uh, with John Newman's group, with um, uh, Nitash Balsara, with Venkat Srinivasan, with Bob Kostecki and others. Great innovations going on to develop new kinds of batteries which have uh, new anodes, new cathodes, new membrane materials in them, and there's every reason to believe that it's possible to make a battery that will be much better. And I'm very happy to say that over the last several months, we've been engaged in a very deep set of discussions with Argon. And I believe we'll end up having a joint and very deep, fruitful collaboration with Argon National Lab in the development of uh, new batteries. In the, case, in the case of storage, the last thing I would mention is simply that we can imagine that hydrogen storage uh, is another very, very important topic. Um, it's something which uh, hydrogen, you'll remember, uh, has kind of uh, gone up and down in terms of like lots of energy uh, topics do. Um, at one time, it was thought to be very important for us, then less, now more. Uh, in any case, in the end, the big problem with hydrogen, we could split water to make hydrogen oxygen. We keep the hydrogen as a fuel. The big problem is how could we store the hydrogen? And again, there, there are new materials like these metal organic frameworks that offer tremendous possibilities for that. And in fact, uh, this is a slide I showed you a little while ago. I showed you for carbon capture and sequestration this slide, which showed some new materials. But in fact, these exact same materials could be useful not just for carbon capture, but also in catalysis, batteries, fuel cells, all kinds of places, making my point once again that the basic science can touch a whole bunch of these different technologies uh, in very positive ways. And that gives you a feeling, at least, I think, for all the parts, ultimately, of this carbon cycle initiative. And what I see, what I would like to see emerging, and I believe our community is really capable of, is to imagine this problem at a larger scale than we have as a laboratory hitherto, and to couple it with an expanded and renewed effort in energy analysis so that we can come to a better understanding of how all these different parts are going to play together um, as we go forward. And um, I'd like to remind you of these five initiatives. Um, I'd like everyone at the lab to be able to remember that there's these five things and that we're all trying to get them done 
and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, the question of geoengineering. I mean, you know, when we start to think about what the solutions to, uh, the, to making a stable carbon cycle look like, uh, what you start to realize is that um, essentially any technology that we implement on a scale that's big enough to actually count, um, actually, you know, on a terawatt kind of scale, um, if you want to call that geoengineering, you probably could, right? Uh, so uh, I, I guess my feeling about it is that uh, what I would like for us to really focus on is um, what does an energy future look like where the CO2 cycle turns out to be stable? And what are the pieces of that that can all come together into it? Now, there are, of course, people who say we should put reflectors up and, you know, things, you know I'm not convinced that, that we need to go to that route yet. And I guess I would say that the distinction between so-called geoengineering and implementing a new energy technology on a terawatt scale may be kind of, you know, moot at some level. Yeah. Um, the Natural Research Council released a study showing that the health damages of energy in 2005 were comparable to the estimated long-term carbon damages for the emissions of the same year. I mean, so is health part of this yet? Or, I mean, that, that's actually... You're talking about resource constraints and carbon constraints, but human health, yeah. and especially in the developing world, China and India, there's a huge yeah. disease burden, mm -hmm. much greater in the U.S., even though it's large associated yeah. with energy. Yeah. Does well, that come in? <laughs> certainly anything that we... Uh, you know, you know, we want to imagine a science that's actually sustainable here, a technology that's actually sustainable. So uh, it's hard to see how it could be sustainable if it's truly damaging or if it's, you know, in some way uh, uh, causing more uh, trouble than we, than, than we want. So it certainly has to be a part of it. Uh, I, and, and, you know, uh, let me speak to that point. I, I get a number of people asking, is this part of it or is this not part of it? And I guess I would say, this is an umbrella. And if we're capable as a community of doing it, Come under the umbrella, help us all work together. Fine, you know, it can happen here. Uh, so uh, that's my sense of it. Yeah. So you, you talked quite a bit about the need to have people from all social different disciplines talking to each other. But at the same time, last the, your previous talk, you mentioned the efforts to establish satellite campuses. And it seems to me like those two things sort of go against each other. If uh -huh. you want everybody, ideally, we yeah. want everybody in the same place. Yeah. So yeah. So I mentioned the need for a satellite campus, not multiple satellite campus. <laughs> I think the problem that we face actually is that today we have five satellite campuses because we have very large programs in five different locations off-site. Uh, and so my desire would be to bring all those things, you know, ideally, of course, all to one place. Uh, I'm not sure that physically the site here is going to enable us to do all the work that we're capable of, but all to be here. So. Uh, in that sense, I'd like to see us uh, in no more than two sites, uh, which would be heading in the direction of making. Now, how we go about doing that while uh, keeping all the collaboration going is very important for us to do. Uh, and we're going to have to overcome the, you know, we, our site physically offers us tremendous benefits. It's a wonderful place to be. We're adjacent to the Berkeley campus. We build all these ties. But it physically also limits us because of the geography. The site is just constraining. And so we have to manage that problem the best that we can. And part of it's going to be by looking at the possibility of having uh, some of the work off-site. And we're going to have to manage very, very carefully what parts are off-site and how they different parts connect. You know, that's the best that we can do. Yeah. Do you see uh, the depletion of oil reserves as a serious uh, challenge to the European Oh, you know, it's a very complicated topic. And there's lots of uh, discussion around it. I mean, uh, I guess I'd say two things to that. One is, uh, if we look overall 
at the uh, supply of fossil fuel broadly, not just oil, but any version of sort of carbon that you could burn, um, there's plenty of it <laughs> for quite a while. Uh, and really, in a sense, what we would say is um, rather than running out of oil, we're more concerned about running out of atmosphere because we're, you know, it's a very thin layer that we're just, you know, changing. Uh, I will say that the oil reserves uh, contain within them, uh, it, it, it's almost a shame, it's almost a crying shame to burn it because it contains within it the ability to make so many mo molecules that we can use for other purposes uh, that if we had a technology which allowed us uh, to uh, not burn it, uh, uh, we would uh, use it for, you know, more wisely. So that's probably going to be an issue. And in fact, it could turn out that some of the biofuels research going on at the laboratory, that some of its impact will turn out to be not just in energy, but also in the ability to make uh, products which we can't, we won't be able to get in the future as we deplete the oil reserves. Uh, and we'll need to be able to make those molecules some other way. So um, I guess I'd say that the one thing to remember is we're probably running out of atmosphere, you know. Yeah. The role of fusion is, uh, you know, there's wonderful research going on um, to develop the fusion source. Uh, just uh, down the road from us at Livermore Lab, there's a great project with the uh, National Ignition Facility. I had a real nice paper in Science the other day showing some of their very earliest results with uh, uh, huge energy densities being achieved. Uh, it's an exciting field of research, and I'd like to see it uh, uh, continue. So, and our laboratory participates in it. We have the uh, uh, I know of grants here somewhere, Grant Logan, but we have the NDCX uh, project uh, here uh, developing the ability to uh, uh, create ion beams that can uh, potentially, you know, play a role in that. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an important area, um, you know, so it, it didn't, didn't come out as one of the circles on my graph because it's not come out as being one of the larger focal areas for our laboratory. It's been one that we've participated and helped in, and I think it's an important activity. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that one of the overarching goals of Carbon Cycle 2.0 is to serve as a, a linking point between the lab and all the research that we do and communities. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, can you talk a little bit about the process that the good ideas that researchers come up with here uh, are taken through to the communities, either you know, specifically to policymakers um, or to industry to see that those ideas actually get put into action? So the question is, how will output from this laboratory be put into action and also how will we link with communities. So in terms of being put into action, um, I do want to encourage, excuse me, all the scientists here at the laboratory to be thinking about this individually because there's not one answer to that. Um, but I will say that there's many, many ways in which the scientists here can participate in seeing their technology actually transfer into the real world of use. Um, those might involve, um, you know, uh, uh, tech transfer to a small startup company that you as a scientist here from the laboratory could play a role in, in founding, and I support people doing that very, very much. Uh, or it could be part of, uh, uh, you know, finding a larger company that could get engaged and license it. Or we could have deeper partnerships with some companies that would be spending more time here, as is done in some parts of the laboratory, so that, that we can have uh, deeper contact there. So all of those are important things. Now, in terms of information though, I also feel, um, you know, I've listed community, you know, building community is one of our goals and community relations. Uh, there's also, uh, so there's a dimension of technology transfer, but there's also just a dimension of information transfer. As our community becomes more able to understand this problem and to, to bracket it, we need to be communicating clearly what the results of our work are. And uh, we have a whole series of initiatives to try to improve how we do that. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, probably a separate topic that I need to come and talk to the whole group about, but we should quadruple our efforts to do that much more than we have. We've done it, but we could do a lot more than we have, and we need to get better at it, much better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yes. 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 Yes.
Absolutely, absolutely. So ETD, you know, is in fact moving beyond that Windows testing facility, and now two floors of Building 90 are about soon to become, because of a new DOE grant, congratulations that they were able to get it, is going to become a building test facility, a national building test facility. So it's going to, that effort is going to grow uh, substantially. But one thing that I mentioned the other day was probably almost a third of the responses that I got when I sent out my request for uh, advice on what are some good strategic goals for the laboratory, probably a good third of those responses were people saying, uh, please make the lab a greener workplace and show how you can do that. And I, I listen to that and I hear that very seriously and you'll be hearing more from us uh, because there's much more that we can do just to find ways in which we all can make the laboratory a greener place. Um, in terms of how much energy the buildings are using that are not laboratory-based buildings, also the lab ones. Um, you may know, for example, the, the uh, low-energy use chemical hood that was uh, developed here at the laboratory and which is now becoming uh, more widespread. So even in laboratories we can do those things, but also in our office places and so on we can do much more. But as a community, uh, we can do more to use energy more effectively, and I think we need to build that up too. So. Um, it's something we need, it should be a part of this initiative, and I can't give you sort of concrete more than that now, except to say it's very much in my mind, and I'd like to encourage people who are interested in it, we'll be trying to have more initiatives in this area as we go along, uh, join in on them. Uh, we've got some things that will be coming, in fact, even later this week, I think we'll be making some early announcements in those areas, yeah. Okay, super. So we're going to turn now to uh, the first uh, talk in a series of talks that will be going for the whole week, uh, which will be given by Bill Collins on climate modeling. <laughs>